thank you all for coming to this um, presentation for emergency disaster preparedness. Um, my name is Mona Friels. I'm the emergency management coordinator for Heartland Fire. And Heartland Fire covers the cities of El Cajon, La Mesa, and Lemon Grove. And really getting together a disaster supplies kit or a disaster plan tends to be overwhelming, people think. But it really is very simple. It's a matter of just these steps. So you want to know what your risks are. So in this area, what are our risks? Once you know those risks, how do we plan for those? What kinds of things can we do? Once you have a plan, getting those supplies together so that you have a kit to support your plan. And then you want to make sure that you're, you're informed. Information is the most important thing that you can do. And the best way to get information is to be involved. So we can really take something that tends to be a very scary situation and break it down to some very small manageable steps for everybody. Okay. During the presentation, if you have any questions, just please feel free to raise your hand. And then we'll just take those questions as they come up. Okay. So the first one is knowing the disaster risks in your area. In this area, and really in all of San Diego County, our major disaster risks are fire, flood, and earthquake. So fire, not just in terms of the wildfires or the big fires, but fires also for single family house fire. So when you're planning for an emergency, people tend to think of it as this big, the catastrophic one. What we want you to plan, take those same steps for just the everyday emergencies that happen. Okay, so one of the things we wanna do is make sure that you have smoke detectors installed. So does everybody have those in your house, hopefully? Yes? Okay. And how many of you are homeowners? Okay. So homeowners, as of July 1st, 2011, it was a new law that you also needed to have a carbon monoxide detector. Do all of you have one of those now? No. Ooh, almost all of my homeowners. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to make sure that you get one of those, because that's the silent killer. So carbon monoxide, you usually don't smell it, you don't hear it, you don't know it's there, you fall asleep, and then you just don't wake up. So you want to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. So you want to make sure you install some of those. If you live in an area that tends to have some more brush, we want to get a defensible space around your house. Make sure that you don't have trees that are growing over and, and hanging on to your roof areas. Make sure that you don't have your firewood, if you have a fireplace, stacked up against your house. And you just want to kind of manage some of those things that are going to burn right up to your house. So making a defensible area. You also want to make sure that you have um, insurance, whether you're a homeowner or for those of you who are renters, renters insurance. And the big thing is, to remember every year, you should get a letter from your insurance agent that says, hey, it's time to review your policy. And most people get that letter and say, sure. And then you file it away and you never call your insurance agent again. By law, they have to send you that letter every year. And what they want you to do is they really want you to look at the market has changed, the value of your home has changed, all of those types of things. You want to make sure that you have the appropriate amount of insurance. Um, during past disasters, we have found that you know, people had insurance, but they were underinsured. So they re really could not go back and rebuild and start their life again. So insurance is very important. Okay. So those are the risks. Those are the things that we need to be careful of. Once we know those risks, we can start working on our plan. So how many of you at the beginning of this presentation think you're ready for a disaster, you have a plan? Yeah, three or four. <laughs> Let's see if you feel the same way at the end. We have a question right over here. Well, how will I know if my neighborhood's being evacuated? That's a great question. How are you going to know if your neighborhood is being evacuated? One of the things, hopefully, that you've done is you've made sure that you have registered your cell phone. Everybody have a cell phone? Almost everybody? That you've registered your cell phone with Alert San Diego. And that is our reverse 911 system. So we're going to use reverse 911 as the primary method of letting you know that we're evacuating or we're asking you to shelter in place or whatever the situation is. We automatically in the database have your home phone number if you have a landline, but you have to self-register your cell phone. So when you register your cell phone, and you can go online, and at the end of the presentation, I'll show you how to do that. Um, you register your cell phone, and that way we'll call your cell phone as well, and you'll get those inf that information. You'll also all see it on, if you're watching TV, you should see it scroll across the bottom of your screen. If you're listening to the radio, you should hear the emergency alert system come through. Um, so there's a variety of ways, depending on what we have to do. Sometimes we have to evacuate a neighborhood so quickly that it's a matter of the police department going through a neighborhood with their PA system saying, get out. So you know, we're going to take all of those measures and different communication methods um, as we can, but those are the primary ones that we use. So thanks for asking that. So we need to have an evacuation plan. When we do ask you to evacuate, do you know how? Do you know where to go? Do you know how to get out of your house? You know, I have a two-story house. All of our bedrooms are upstairs. So how do you get out of those bedrooms upstairs? 
you know, do you have a rope ladder if you can't get down um, the staircase, those types of things. So thinking about those things ahead of time are going to help you when you have to evacuate. There are times when literally we average about a two and a half minute evacuation time. We need you out and we need you out now. So it's not a whole lot of time. So thinking of what kinds of things, not only how are you going to get out, but what kinds of things are you going to take with you? Do you have a place where you have all of your documents or the things that you want to take with you when you evacuate? You know, if you have time, then you can put those things together. But if you have to leave quickly, do you have those things in mind already? And do you have a meeting place? If it's a single family house fire and it's just your structure that's threatened and you have to get out of the house, you know, do you have a meeting place for your family? Do you know where to meet at the front of the house? Do you know where to meet in the back of the house? So that you can kind of get together and do a head count and make sure everybody's there. Um, I'll tell you that I worked um, a fire in Spring Valley um, three days before Christmas one time and a four-year-old boy unfortunately died in the fire because everybody thought somebody else had him and by the time they had all gotten together and did the head count it was too late. So a meeting place is, is crucial to make sure that everybody knows that you know you're safe and you're all out. And then a communications plan. How many of you had problems communicating during the power outage using your cell phones? Most of you. All right, so what's going to happen during a disaster is you know, if it's more than just your single family house, we're going to have our communication systems that are inundated. So texting will go through faster than calling because it takes more bandwidth for a phone call to go through than it does a text. So think about when you're going to communicate with people, doing it via text is going to be more successful than doing it via the phone. You're also freeing up those, data, those voice lines for people. Having an out-of-state contact. You want somebody out of the area who's not affected by the disaster that everybody can call and say, hey, we're OK. You know, this is where I am. And, and as you start calling and all the family members call in, you kind of have a roster of where everybody is and everybody's safe. So having an out-of-area contact. If you have school-age children, knowing what their uh, school plan is. You know, you can do family reunification. What types of information do you need to, chat, to take with you to reunify, to pull your kid out of school? You know, so what's their emergency plan? And then I talked a little bit about registering your cell phone. The good thing about registering your cell phone is you can register your cell phone with more than one address. So I have my cell phone registered to my house, to my kid's house, to their school, to my work. So if anything happens in any of those areas, I get the phone call. So you can register it to more than one place. Okay. You also, oh, you have a question. Yes, sir. Well, how do you practice your plan once you get it established? Okay, great question. So you want to make sure that, just as our little picture shows, you practice. You know, studies have shown that we perform the way that we practice, which is why singing groups sing so often and musicians play so often, because you actually perform in an emergency the way that you would practice. So you want to practice your plan. You can do that by, one way is, you know, if any of you cook like I do, your, your smoke alarm probably goes off kind of often, right? <laughs> Instead of ignoring it, or going up and poking it with a broom, or doing the little towel dance with it, use that as the opportunity to practice your evacuation plan. You know, anybody in the house hears it, that's our opportunity to get outside. We've so conditioned people to completely ignore that, because they just think, well, mom's cooking again, <laughs> that, <laughs> that we ignore it, kind of like car alarms now. So when it goes off for real, we're not going to get outside. So we want to make sure that we take some of those opportunities you can also do twice a year, you should change the batteries in your smoke detector. So what you want to do is, you know, when you change the clocks, change the batteries in your smoke detector, practice your plan. So kind of build those into some routine things that you already do. And that way you are getting that practice in. So thank you for asking that. You, we have one more question. What do I do with our pets when we have to evacuate? That's amazing that you asked that because pets was my next thing here. Pets, include your pets. <laughs> you know, for most people, their pets are like their children. You know, um, especially when we have our kids that get up and leave us and they go away. My dog will never leave me. He's not going to go off to college. He's not, <laughs> you know, so our pets are very important to us. So we need to make sure that we include our pets in our plan. We need to make sure that we have disaster supplies for them. We need to make sure that when we evacuate, we evacuate with our pets and that we have the proper supplies with our pets. So if you're going to evacuate and you have a dog or a cat or any kind of smaller animal, evacuate them in their kennel. So cats snakes, birds, chickens, all that kind of stuff. Evacuate them with their kennel because when you drop them off at an animal shelter, you don't want them running around free with all of the other dogs and cats and 
animals that are running free, right? You want your animal to have something that's familiar to them and they have their own little home and it's comfortable. You, if they're on a special diet of any kind, take that pet food with you to the animal shelter. That way they can continue on their special diet. So just like a person, when you're evacuating, think about what kinds of things your pets might need. Okay. Fuel in the car. How many people during the power outage ran out of gas or was very low on gas? <laughs> I'll tell you, it was amazing how many people the next day, <laughs> the next day that we had all these cars that had to be towed the next day off the freeway because they ran out of gas and you can't pump gas during a power outage because they don't have generators on the pumps. So most people wait till they have the gas light on and then they do that whole little bat cave thing where they go home and they press the garage door opener two blocks away till it opens because you know, we never want to say hi to our neighbor or anything. And you just go into your garage, you close it, and then you think, well, I'll get gas tomorrow. And tomorrow doesn't always come. And not just for things like power outages, but I'll tell you that we had um, two people that died in the fire because they ran out of gas driving, evacuating, driving to a shelter, and they didn't have enough gas to get there, and the fire overtook them. So you want to make sure that you never have less than a quarter of a tank. If you have an RV or a trailer, that's a great option for disaster preparedness. You know, you have all your supplies in there already. Usually the, all, all my friends who have RVs or trailers, they're usually almost always stocked. You have a generator. You know, that's a great thing to use for your disaster preparedness. So while you're putting your supplies together, don't overlook that if you own one. Okay. Your utility mains. You need to make sure that you know how to turn off your power, your water, and your gas. So you should know where those mains are and know how to turn them off. And just know that you should never turn off your gas unless you're told to do so or you smell gas. Because you can turn your water back on and you can turn your power back on, but you cannot turn your gas back on. SDG&E has to come out. And if we all do that, that's 3.6 million people that have to have their, their gas restored. And it may be a while before they can get to you. <laughs> so only turn off your gas if you're told to do so. But you should know how to do it and you should have the tools handy to do it. So when you turn off your gas, you usually want that wrench that's going to do it. Take that wrench and twisty tie it to your gas meter. Because if it's in the garage somewhere or in the kitchen drawer, or, you know, odds are you may not be able to find it or that part of the house may be destroyed or damaged and you can't get to it. So just twisty tie it on. And then we talked a little bit about practicing it. Practice, practice it as often as you can. And like I said, we perform the way that we practice. So the more you do it, the better you're gonna be. All right, disaster supplies. So now we kind of, we know what our risks are we're developing this plan, and now we get, have to get some supplies to support that plan. So we know that there's basic things like food and water. And one of the things I would suggest is that you have um, food and water the same, uh, you have a question. How much emergency cash should I have? Oh, good question. So cash is the next thing on my list. We should have, um, depending on your family. If you're a single person, you probably are gonna have less cash than if you have, you know, we have six kids, so we're probably gonna have more cash. Um, so depending on your family type, um, but I always say about $100, maybe $200, depending on it, you know, how much of cash you can afford to set aside. The important thing about emergency cash, though, is to make sure you have it in small dollar increments. So inevitably during disasters, we always hear stories like somebody had to pay $100 for a gallon of water, right? We've heard that, and everybody gets mad, and they say, oh, they gouged them for this water. And what probably happened was the power was down. The person only had an ATM card and a $100 bill, and they went to the grocery store whose power was down so they couldn't use their ATM card, and they didn't have any, ca any change. So if that person really wanted ga a gallon of water, they were gonna pay $100 for it because that's all they had. So if you have your emergency cash in smaller dollar increments, that probably won't happen to you. So keep them in smaller dollars. You wanna have all your important documents. In this day and age, we can keep documents electronically. So take all of your emergency documents and scan them. You can either, if you don't have a scanner, you can take them to Walmart to get scanned. You can take them to Staples. There's a lot of different places that will scan your documents for you. But you can get those scanned and you can get them put them on a flash drive. You can save them to online. There's a lot of companies who have online storage. They can be stored in the cloud um, very securely. But you wanna make sure you have all of your documents. And not just your documents, but your pictures. Um, when I was little, when I was nine, my house burned down. And we lost everything. And part of what we lost were all of our pictures. There are very few pictures of me before the age of nine the ones that we do have were like family members had had them and were, had sent them back to us. There are very few pictures of me before that age because we lost them in the fire. So with electronics and technology being what it is, we don't have to do that anymore. You know, have all your pictures in Facebook. <laughs> Just make sure that they're secure. 
Um, you want to have clothes and shoes, and you rotate those. We don't really have to rotate seasonally because it's you know 78 degrees here year-round. But if you have kids that are changing sizes, now I can't keep my son in the same size pants or shoes for two months. So when I have his clothes set aside, I want to make sure that they're rotating so that they fit him. So having your shoes and your clothes, and make sure that they're closed-toed shoes. Because if, if we have an earthquake, you have to walk through things, you want to have some kind of good rugged shoe to walk in. Personal hygiene items, those are always important. Those are the things we tend to forget about, but they're some of the most important things that we need after a disaster. And if you have any special needs items, if you wear glasses, if you wear contacts, yes, there's a question in the back. I take medication daily, so what do I do if I have to evacuate? Okay, it's, very, it's going to be very important for you when you evacuate that your medication is part of your supplies list. So as we talk about special needs items, one of the things you should have is like a, one of those pill boxes that have a seven day. So as you get your prescription, you put seven days aside and then you start taking your prescription and then you refill and then you rotate those seven days. So you should always have seven days put aside because when you need to evacuate, you want to take that medication with you. When you go into an evacuation shelter, we will have a nurse there and if we have to replace medications, we'll work on getting that done, but it's usually going to take you know, a day or two before we can get the pharmacist to get it all, you know, get your prescription together and that kind of thing. So make sure you have your medications with you. Any other special needs items? If you have a cane, you know, glasses, contacts, hearing aids, um, wheelchairs, any of those types of things that are special to you that you need to have with you, make sure that's part of your kit. Um, and then any miscellaneous items, you know, you want to make sure you have work gloves. Duct tape works for everything. I love duct tape. Um, <laughs> you know, the tissues, that kind of stuff, because, you know, you're always going to have toilet paper needs. Yes. So where do you suggest is the best place to keep our emergency supplies? So where do you keep your emergency supplies? The answer to that is in a couple different places. So you should have emergency supplies at home, and you should kind of keep those maybe in, separated into two areas. Keep, you know, in those round buckets are usually a good place to kind of container them all or in those Rubbermaid buckets. So have one in the garage by the garage door somewhere and maybe one inside in an internal closet. Most of us have like a hallway closet, those kind of things. So have them there. And then definitely have another set, a smaller set in your car. And then if you have children, they should have their own. They should have a backpack that hangs on their bed and that backpack should have things. And we're, we'll get into the kids in just a moment. But you should have one at home um, and you want to make sure that you rotate all of these things. You want to have one in your car, and again, rotating is important, especially in your car, because it gets hotter in your car and things aren't going to stay good as long. So you need to make sure that you look at those dates and you rotate things. And then your child kit. There are certain items that for a children's kit really need to be in there. So during a disaster, the adults are freaking out, right, because everything is on fire, things are shaking and breaking and all those kind of things. The kids could really care less. They're just bored. So you want to make sure that you have entertainment items in there. And those entertainment items, again, like rotating. So my kids started off with, you know, travel games, you know, coloring books, travel games, and they went to Nintendo DSs and Playstations, and now they have iPhones and iPads. So, you know, they rotate kind of as they get older. So whatever is the appropriate entertainment. You want to make sure you have comfort items. So, you know, some kind of a stuffed animal. If they have that special blankie, maybe you cut off a little corner of that and you stick it in their disaster pack. Um, you want to make sure you have some snacks in there. So, you know, Cheerios, Goldfish, Apple Juice, the little waters, all of those types of things. Just have a couple in their backpack. Um, change of clothes and shoes. Again, rotate those because they grow so fast. Probably the most important thing, though, is your family contact list. So take a picture, a family photo, and on the back of that, write your contact list. Mom's you know, name, cell phone number, dad's name, cell phone number, older brother and sisters, grandmas, grandpas, whoever you can, write it on the back of that picture. It's also very important that your children know that your names are not mommy and daddy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> because what will happen, what happened in Katrina was we had to evacuate, and it was mass evacuation of people on buses and lots of confusion. We ended up with a bunch of three-year-olds in Oklahoma, and the parents were in Texas. And when you ask the three-year-olds what their parents' names were, it was, we got a lot of mommy and daddy. Right. Very hard to reunify families that way. So make sure as soon as your kids are old enough that they know that that's not your name and that they have a picture of your family with your information on the back and that that's their backpack and they keep with them. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's great for the schools. So
So like I said in the beginning, one of the most important things is information, be informed. During a disaster, there is no lack of information. There's information everywhere, it's information overload. There's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's all kinds of social media, there's the actual media on TV, there's the news. They have to fill that space with something, anything. It's not always gonna be accurate or good information. And so that's what you wanna make sure of. We have a question in the back. Where is the best place to get that information? Okay, so where's the best place to get that information? In San Diego County, we have two radio stations. It's um, COGO, which now has an AM and an FM channel. And that is the official emergency information channel. So all of the other radio stations and TV stations will be giving out information that you may not hear on COGO, and that's because COGO is only gonna give out verified information. Okay. How many of you are country music lovers? Couple, all right. It's more than I usually get in a crowd. So country, if you're a country music fan, you knew that before the power outage, um, there was KSON and there was New Country 95.7, right? After the power outage, there was KSON. And all of a sudden, there's a bunch of people talking on 95.7 and there's no music. What happened was, one of our lessons learned, is that Kogo 600 AM was our only emergency station. And after the power outage, they realized that A, nobody listens to AM radio, right? And <laughs> so then you heard the couple of things that, <laughs> and B, the FM actually transmits further than the AM signal. So they went back and Clear Channel said, okay, well you can have FM 95.7. Now they broadcast Kogo on both of those. So that's the best place to get your information. There's another question back there. Now that you mentioned the radio, they talked about there about uh, sheltering in place. What are they talking about? Okay. okay. So sheltering in place. We talk a lot about evacuations. Sheltering in place is kind of the opposite. Um, one of the messages that we gave out during the power outage was stay where you are. So shelter in place. We don't want you on the roads. There's no power, so we have traffic lights that are down. Um, you know, the road conditions, we didn't know what condition they were in. During an earthquake, we'll probably almost always have you shelter in place. During some hazardous material um, disasters, we'll ask you to shelter in place because you're safer at home than being out on the road and trying to go to a shelter. So we're gonna ask you to shelter in place. And if you shelter in place, particularly if it is something having to do with a hazardous material, you wanna do that in an internal room. So most people have an internal bathroom that has no windows. Kind of a room with no windows is really where we want you. And you wanna take your radio with you. <laughs> so take your emergency radio or your computer or whatever it is, wherever you can get information. And uh, you wanna take that with you into your room that you're gonna shelter in place in. If it's an earthquake or those kind of things, it's not necessarily important that you go into an, an internal room. But definitely, if there's any kind of hazardous material, we want to make sure you do that. So we have two local emergency stations. We also have 211 San Diego. So 211, you dial it just like you would 911. It's a free call from your cell phone. It's a free call from your landline. It's a 24-hour number. They speak 127 languages. And that's really where all of the cities and the county give 211 all of our information so that the residents, we always tell them, call 211 if you have any questions. They know where all the shelters are, they know where the road closures are, they know if you should shelter in place, they have all of that information. So you wanna call 211. Social media is also another great place. If you use social media at all, Heartland Fire has a Twitter account, we have a Facebook account, that's where we're gonna push that information, we have a Nixle account, so we're gonna get all of that information out as soon as possible. So during the power outage, SDG&E was tweeting every 45 minutes. So as soon as they tweeted, I was retweeting all of their tweets. So if you followed Heartland Fire, you got something every 45 minutes, up until about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we have social media. And then pre-disaster, we have a lot of websites where you can get information. There's ready.org, which is the national website to get disaster preparedness information. There's FEMA.gov, that has all of the national information. Um, the Red Guide to Recovery is a great thing to read before a disaster happens because it talks about the recovery process. And it was written here in San Diego, so it's local to San Diego resources. But it tells you things about insurance and those types of things and how do you recover. So the more you can educate yourself before a disaster on the recovery process, the easier it's gonna be to navigate through that process. SDEmergency.com, that's the county's website. And it has preparedness, response, and recovery information on one website. And then we have heartlandfire.org, which has Again, the same thing, preparedness, response, and recovery information all on one website. So there's a lot of websites you can get information from. But the best place to get information is to be involved. So if you volunteer 
you can volunteer on a CERT team. So how many of you have heard of CERT, are part of CERT? We have a couple. So CERT is a community emergency response team. And um, what you'll do is you'll come through and you'll do 20 hours of training. And really what it's meant to do is to help people kind of take you out of the victim pool. We teach you light search and rescue. We teach you tr medical triage. Um, we teach you disaster preparedness. We teach you those types of things so that you can, the whole premise is to take care of yourself, take care of your family, and take care of your neighborhood. Okay. So CERT is a great thing to take. Also neighborhood watch. If you don't currently belong to a neighborhood watch program, you know, you can get your neighbors together and you can start a neighborhood watch program or join an existing neighborhood watch program and that's a great place to get information. The American Red Cross always needs volunteers during a disaster. Well, before, during, and after a disaster. So they're a good place to get information. Uh, the Salvation Army, the Burn Institute. There's a lot of different organizations that have some kind of either preparedness response or recovery role. And if you're involved in those organizations, you're going to get the information firsthand. So that's the best place to get the information. And that's my contact information. The other way to get information is if you have any questions, um, please feel free to give me a call. If it's during an emergency, I'm probably not going to call you right away because <laughs> I'll be standing in the emergency operations center. Um, but again, our website and my email address are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. Um, my email comes to my phone, so I get it all the time, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Are there any additional questions? No? Thank you guys very much for coming.